1066, Battle of Hastings. Hello everyone, I'm Felipe. And I'm Lillian. And we are the Postmodern Family. We are Americans who live in the UK and we react to Great Britain. We make five new videos a week, so hit that subscribe button now. Today we're going to react to a documentary explaining the monarchs of England, starting with in 1066, William the Conqueror of Normandy. All right. I guess I was trying to clarify that we're only going to react to the first three and we're not going to do all of them. No, one episode will be one king. Oh, it's just one? Yeah. Oh, we're just doing one. William, William the Conqueror. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm confused. And then we'll do another one with the second king. And that'll be two episodes. Okay. Because we've done three episodes so far. The story of the kings and queens of England is more surprising than you might think. It's a fine drama, a thousand years of tales of lust and betrayal, of heroism and cruelty, of mysteries, murders, tragedies, and triumphs. But there's more than that. For example, one of the most reliable chronicles describes how a king of England proposed adopting Islam <clears throat> as the national religion. What? This episode, the first of six, includes that tale. It tells the story of the English crown from 1066 to 1216, from one French invader, William, to the next, Louis. Yes, Louis, another surprise. A king of England who's pretty much disappeared from history. It's easier to say where the history of the English monarchy ends than where it begins. It ended on the 14th of October, 1066, here, at what became Battle Abbey on Senlac Hill near Hastings. Been there. We all know that this was where Harold was killed and replaced by William the Conqueror. And Harold was the last Englishman to be crowned king. From then on, the sovereign would always be from a foreign family, right down to Queen Elizabeth II. He's German, right? Saxe-Coburg. So a history of the kings and queens of England isn't like the history of kings and queens anywhere else in the world. What happened here on that October day started a completely new history, which is why it's the one date in history that everybody knows. Is it? Mm -hmm. 1066. I didn't know it in the US. Hmm. The story of that day was spelled out in a strip cartoon, the Bayer Tapestry, probably stitched for William's brother, Odo. Here's our hero's first appearance in the story. That's William, Duke of Normandy, about 37 years old in 1064. He's being told that Harold Godwinson, Earl of Wessex at the time, has been shipwrecked on the French coast. One of these guys is Godwinson. I think it's the chap with the handlebar moustache. Saga. He's about six years older than William and the most powerful man in England after King Edward. These are both pretty hard men, survivors in a very tough world. William spent his whole life fighting for survival and was good at it. By the time he was 20, he'd established complete control over Normandy. From then on, he was fighting to hang on to what he had. He got Harold to help him in one of those battles, capturing Mont Saint-Michel. And then, apparently as the price of letting him mouth? go home, had Harold swear to support That's him in becoming the next friends. king of England. Which, as the tapestry very clearly shows, is not what happened. Yeah, yeah, St. Michael's Mount. When old King Edward died, Harold, as we all know, had himself crowned instead. Actually, to be a bit more precise, he had himself elected king. The crown of England in those days was not inherited, but awarded. In William's view, this had all gone very badly wrong, so he set about putting it right. The Norwegian ruler, Harald Hardrada, 
took a similar view. There was an old Norwegian claim to England, which he decided to revive by launching an invasion of his own. Their two fleets arrived within a few days of each other, one in the north of England, one in the south. Both fleets were probably about the same size, about 500 ships. King Harold rushed north and destroyed Hadrada's army. Only about 34 ships made it back to Norway. Then he rushed south. This time, of course, he failed to pull it off. We don't know for sure that the man with the arrow in his eye is Harold, but he certainly died at the battle. He and his axe-wielding, spear-carrying army of Danish and Anglo-Saxon noblemen were simply swept away. In their place were the new rulers of England, Normans on horseback, and William was their master, master of the country. He owned it. He was not an elected king. When he went to London to be crowned on Christmas Day, the population, thinking that was their duty now, tried to elect him. They acclaimed him with loud shouts. The Normans, not knowing what was going on, thought this was some kind of uprising. They rushed out of Westminster Abbey and burned London down. <laughs> England had become a new kind of kingdom, one which was owned lock, stock and barrel by its king. The story we're telling through this series, the story of a thousand years of English history, is the story of this alien conqueror and his successors to the throne. It's the story of how they changed England and changed with it, eventually turning into puppet rulers, symbols of power they cannot wield. And how in that transformation they survived through tides of revolution and republicanism so that today, while they're not quite the only surviving royals in Europe, they alone still lay claim to majesty. <laughs> now, how did that happen? The story of William's reign is really the story of a warrior lord taking all power into his hands. He confiscated all the privately owned land in the country, its new occupiers were tenants of the king, bound to him. People of the north of England, with their Viking capital at York, were much more bound to Scandinavia than to Normandy. They refused to submit. He punished them by destroying all animals and all crops between York and Durham. According to the chronicles, he celebrated Christmas 1070 in the ruins of York. Wow. Intense. The inhabitants were reduced to starvation, even cannibalism. Sixteen years later, when all the land in England was accounted for and valued in his doomsday survey, there were places in Northumbria that were still utterly worthless. The church, too, was made Norman, and old Anglo-Saxon ways crushed. At Glastonbury, archers were stationed inside the abbey, and orders given that the old chants should be replaced by new ones from France. 21 monks were shot, and yet there were limits to his power. A few thousand Normans, most of them not even understanding the language of their new country, couldn't run the place. They needed the English to keep everything working, and William understood that perfectly well. His coronation, he made an oath to uphold the laws of King Edward, to uphold good law and renounce bad. The old courts would continue to function and old traditions would normally be respected. This oath would become fundamental to the coronation of any king. The question, though, would be who got to wear the crown? When William died, bloated and exhausted at the ripe age of 60, his attendants stripped his body and scattered. What mattered now was who would hold the land he'd conquered and how. It had all been his, and it was he who'd decided. On his deathbed in Normandy, he handed out the spoils. He gave his eldest surviving son, Robert, his duchy of Normandy. But it was the younger son, the red-haired William, William Rufus, who the conqueror willed should be acclaimed King of England. And the youngest, Henry, 
was told he would have to be content with £5,000. <laughs> but Henry was his father's son. Content? With £5,000? <laughs> was that likely? Okay, so that's the end of the first one. Yeah. Cool. So, so what did you think? Yeah, I just thought that... Um, I always wondered about this, why we start memorizing... In, in classical conversations, our homeschool mm -hmm. thing, why do we start memorizing... From William. From William the Conqueror, mm -hmm. when there's a whole line of, of English kings before mm. then. Yeah, Anglo-Saxon kings. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I don't know. I thought that was interesting. But yeah, he came and basically conquered. He's the conqueror, He's the conqueror. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that he ravaged the north that way. Mm. That's new to me, that they resorted to cannibalism. I don't know if that's an exaggeration, but... I don't know. Yeah. But one thing people... I used to get confused, at least. When I envisage William the Conqueror, I envisage what I see as a Frenchman today. But mm -hmm. they're not. Mm -hmm. They are Viking Frenchmen. Mm -hmm. Tall, etc. Um, they're not the short Frenchmen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we recognize. Oh, yeah. I thought so, of him as more like a Viking. I didn't. I thought, oh, it was a French conquest. And oh. I thought, oh, mon ami. <laughs> I thought of Napoleon and all that, you know. Mm. So, um, but I think what's in, what I'm more interested in is what are the still long-standing ramifications of the nearly thousand-year-old conquest for people today, for mm. for Great Britain today? Mm. Um, what do you think? Do you think there are any? I don't know. Maybe it's a subdued people because clearly he came in and subdued all the Brit <laughs> all the English people who are now under mm. this Norman rule, and they were like, okay with it, I don't know. Well, I mean, before that, you have the Roman conquest mm -hmm. for, I think it's two, three hundred years. Um, I can't remember. And then the empire falls, and then it's just a smattering of Anglos and Saxons. I guess I'm, and... I'm wondering what's, what's really, what's the, English? What is, mm. what is English? If we've been ruled by you know, monarchs are from foreign countries for yeah. the last thousand years. It is strange, isn't it? Um, it's a mongrel like collection mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do they say? They say that is it seventy five percent of English vocabulary is Latin, either mm. direct or through French, because he brings Fr French as the language of the court. Mm -hmm. um, and English as we know it today, when does it get its own feet? Is it thought of to be as Shakespeare is when it gets its own legs? I don't know anything about that stuff. Yeah. Hmm. But I thought that the long-standing ramifications of the conquest were the lands are still to some extent in the possession, the possessions or the possession of the hereditary classes hmm. that he established. Hmm. Um, and I think he goes to Ireland as well, if I'm not mistaken. I don't... William the Conqueror? I thought... No, I, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I'm, it's a fog now, but I thought he establishes his barons and all that in lands, um, in Wales, in Northern England, in the Southwest, but also in Ireland. I thought... I could be wrong. Hmm. But whilst that land possession has been diminishing through the centuries, that it's still, to some extent, intact. That's what I thought. So that land is such a premium here. Mm -hmm. um, and the, re the a big reason why the um, noble families here continue to exist is because of, of the land. And it's, it's rent value. Mm. Or the richness. The, it, wasn't it known as being really fertile land, a good pl farming land? Yeah, but as we saw country? in that very, um, you know, enlightening documentary, the, the Clarkson's, Clarkson's farm. farm, that it is a difficult yeah. business endeavor. That's true. Hmm. Um, thanks so much for watching this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Leave your comments if you were offended that we started at William the Conqueror and not before.
Thanks. Bye. See ya.